it's my distinct privilege to introduce to you today Dr. Phil Keller. Phil is a, a good friend in Christ and he is the president of the California Baptist Foundation and uh, his daddy was a preacher. It's kind of like your family, multi-generational. His daddy Max Kell was a wonderful church planner and preacher for many years and further north in our state, I believe. Yeah. And uh, it's exciting to have you here today to join us on this day. I was calculating uh, the gifts that people have given over the last 58 years, if you total them all up, exceeds $13 million to pay off this church. So what we have is the conclusion, like reaching the goal, crossing the line, so to speak. And uh, so we're at the point of finally retiring the succession of debt and construction and so forth here on this property. And it's paid for, folks. It's paid for. Well, thank you, Rick. Um, let me say I've got a special envelope today that I brought to the church. How many of you knew, knew Everett Crossland and his wife? Has anybody heard of the Crosslands? Well, at California Baptist Foundation, Rick, my dad used to say to me, he was a Baptist preacher, after I went to the work at the foundation 20 years ago, I've been there 20 years, he used to look at me, he was in his 80s, and he must have done this a half a dozen times. He'd say, Phil, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do at the foundation? What's a foundation? Well, a foundation is a charity that supports other charities. So California Baptist Foundation exists to help support our churches, our convention, missionaries, our, our, our university, our seminaries. And so um, we challenge people to remember of the local church and to remember the Lord's work in their wills and, and trusts and estates. That's primarily where we work with people. And so the Crosslands did that. They did it in a little bit unusual way. Um, the Crosslands actually named California Baptist Foundation as a partial beneficiary of an IRA and life insurance policy. Anybody here got a life insurance policy? Yeah, I do. Or an IRA, retirement account. Well, how many people even think to say, well, you know, I could give 10% of that or uh, more to the Lord's work than the Crosslands did. And so today I'm privileged. The money came to the foundation. But the Crosslands had put in writing that they wanted the money to go to their church. And so today I'm presenting a check for $47,000 to your church from the Crosslands. Right? Yeah. Right? Thank you to say that is awesome, and that fulfills the desires of Everett K. Crossland. I had met with them, prayed with him after K. Uh, went home to be with the Lord. This was a desire of his heart. We had received the first part of their gift, which enabled us to pay off uh, our final mortgage and also to uh, replace the roof on our preschool. And this gift will be used uh, toward completing the refurbishing of our worship center, which really is in need of refurbishing. That's great. Well, it's always fun to go to a church when I've got a check, Rick. I, I... You can get to keep it home. You know? you got, he got to touch it. At least he got to touch it. Isn't that great? <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, um, my predecessor, Glenn Payton, who was the president of the foundation, used to say as he spoke to people and Christians, he said, when you give a gift from your estate or from your life insurance or your retirement account, it'll be the easiest gift you'll ever make. You'll never miss it because you'll be in heaven. <laughs> so that's what we do. Now, I'm an interesting uh, kind of guy because I'm an attorney by training. I grew up in, in a little Baptist church in Eureka, California. You may know where Eureka is? Way north. Yeah. That's where my dad pastored as I went from first grade through two years of college. And then he, he moved to Sacramento with the family, and I followed later. And I was his uh, worship leader as I went to law school and then practiced law for 15 years. I was attorney by day and worship leader by night. Uh, where's Danny? Danny, you still in here? 
Okay, Danny. Danny and I go way back. I can't even tell you how far back. We're worship leaders from a prior generation, and I love that music today. The hymns and, and the old worship songs. I tell you, how do you beat those? Um, God is good. So it's really, it's, it's really a privilege to be here today. I've been at the, at the foundation for 20 years. Now I'm an ordained attorney. I'm a very dangerous man. Um, I did go to seminary, though. When my dad was at Golden Gate Seminary back in the 1950s, I went to kindergarten there. So uh, they say you learn, you, get, you learn all you need to know in kindergarten. And so I got my seminary education in kindergarten. But I want to share with you today some things that the Bible says about money. So turn, if you would, first to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul is writing to, to uh, a young man that he's discipled, a young pastor. And in chapter 6, he's giving him some final words of advice. Now, this is a quiz. Did you get the handout that I have today, the outline? Some of you don't need it. If you like it, follow along. But I want to give you a quiz today. 1 Timothy is one of Scripture's greatest money chapters. The, the, these verses here, you're going to recognize. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to start with verse 6. And we're going to fill in the blanks. Paul writing to Timothy says, But godliness with blank is great gain. Godliness with contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And we're going to start there and end there with that word contentment today. Verse 7, for we brought blank into this world, and we can take blank out of it. Nothing, both times. For we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. My dad had five boys and a girl. There were six of us, you know, PKs. Any PKs here today? Yeah, we were um, a pretty rough lot. Our worship leader used to say, the meanest people in Eureka, California live on Higgins Street. And the further down the street you go, the meaner they get. And our pastor and his five boys live in the last house on the left. I was Tex Holland shape. But my dad used to say, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. <laughs> but scripture says, for we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. Do you really understand that? Do you really understand that all the things we treasure, all the things we collect, all the things we work so hard to keep, you can't put them in a trailer and take them with you. <clears throat> and we have to keep that in perspective. God wants us to enjoy this world, but He doesn't want us to worship this world. Verse 8 says, but if we have food and clothing, we will be blank with that. Content. There's that content again. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Verse 9 says, People who want to get rich fall into blank. They fall into temptation. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a blank. That blank is a trap. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin. That blank is ruin and destruction. That verse we can spend the day on by itself. You and I have all watched friends and families and people we respected chase the almighty dollar. And then when they got it, what happened? Oh, I've watched it with professionals that buy cabins and boats and things that, then they're not in church anymore, and pretty soon their family's having issues, and the kids don't know anything about the Lord. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. And then the, verse 10, the one you'll all recognize, for the blank of money is a root of all kinds of evil. What's that? For the, for the love of money. It's interesting he doesn't say money's evil. Money is neutral, and it can be used for good. And we know that Scripture teaches us, and Jesus taught us, that we're to take care of those we love, that we're to be good stewards, that yes, it's all right to enjoy life, yes, it's all right to own things, but don't let those things own you. 
And that's where the problem is. When you begin to love the money, and you begin to love the things more than you love the Lord, and you don't keep it in perspective, that's where the problem is. The message I'm going to do today is, I call it a sandwich sermon. Have you heard of a sandwich sermon? I'm going to give you a slice of, of Paul, and then some meat from Jesus, and then another slice from Paul. So that was the introductory quiz. I would challenge you, learn those verses, teach those verses to your children, or better yet, to your grandchildren. Pay them a dollar a verse or something to learn, learn those verses. Because if they know those verses, oh, it can help them so much in life. Most of us learn those verses the hard way. Today, you, your church is celebrating a great day where you can burn the note and the deed of trust on your church property. Have you got the deed of trust yet? Is the paperwork done yet, Rick? Is the paperwork done on the... It's in the process. It's in the process. Well, those attorneys are slowing the process down. But <laughs> you're going to get to burn that note. And know, Has anybody here had the pleasure, the privilege, the joy of actually burning a note or getting rid of your note on your house? A few of you. Man, isn't that a great feeling? I don't have to pay the bank anymore. I want you to know I'm not there yet, but I'm working on it. And that ought to be a goal. Because the Bible teaches us that we should, to the best of our ability, be in debt to no man. But we should learn to live within our means. Learn to live with what God blesses us with. So, I want us now to look and focus the message today on the words of Jesus. I love to look at what Christ had to say about every topic, but money, of, of course, is a topic he talked about a lot. So I want you to turn, if you're Bible, in your Bibles, to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. At the foundation, we deal with money and people with money all the time. That's what we do. So let me tell you a little bit, as you're looking for Luke 12, what that means. At California Baptist Foundation, our job is to raise and manage resources for Baptist causes. Well, what does that mean? Well, you've got a university down the hill, not too far from here, that has thousands of students there, and a budget that's approaching $200 million a year. Did you know that? That's the annual budget. And yet they need scholarship funds. They need money for sports programs, for nursing programs. And our job is to help raise endowments and trusts where we invest the money every year and the earnings go to support the university. They go to support the seminary. They go to support missionaries. We have cooperative program endowments. We have foreign mission endowments. We've got home mission endowments. We've got Golden Gate Seminary endowments. We have church endowments. Our job is to raise and then manage resources. So how are we doing? We've been around over 60 years now, starting with nothing. And let me say this about Baptists. I love what the old-time preacher... He, one, one year at the Southern Baptist Convention, he looked out at the thousands of people there filling that hall for the convention. And he paused a moment. He said, you know, we're many, but we're not much. We're many, but we're not much. What do you mean? Paul said that God's chosen the humble of this life, the insignificant in the world, to confound the worldly wise. And God's chosen people like us. We're not wealthy. None of us will probably ever be very wealthy. But when we work together, when we work together, and we're each one faithful with what God has given us, then together we can do mighty things. The little foundation that I work at started with nothing. And today, the money we manage for Baptists is right at $105 million that we manage, we invest. And the earnings then go out every year. And that 105 is growing. It's growing. As people go on to their eternal reward and they leave resources for kingdom causes. And our job, we're stewards. We don't own that money. We're stewards of it. Our job is to invest it wisely and then pay out the earnings as we can. So as we look at Jesus' words today, I want you to act as if Jesus was talking to you. I hear the words we're going to read in this first verse more than you would know. When a father passes away and a mother passes away, I get to deal with children. And that's not always easy. Sometimes the children don't like what mom and dad had to say about their possessions. Mom and dad, they're upset about what mom and dad did. And look at this question as Jesus is talking to the crowds in Luke 12, verse 13. Verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, to Jesus, Teacher, Tell my brother 
to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Have you ever heard that before? Have you ever watched a family after the parents died and the children fight a little bit over the money and the stuff? Have you seen that, anybody besides me? Yeah? Sometimes they get along great, but other times they fight. They'll fight over the strangest things. They'll fight over the furniture. They'll fight over the, uh, the quilt. They'll fight over the pictures. And Jesus said he didn't come to be an arbiter over those disputes. He came to bring life. We know that. And yet he's going to spend now the next portion of this chapter talking to that crowd and talking to us about possessions. And you notice the first thing he says in verse 15, then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. That's point number one, be on your guard against every form of greed. Did you realize there's more than one form of greed? I love it when poor people look at rich people and say they're greedy. And the poor people are fighting over every nickel they can get and spending two for every one they make. <laughs> greed is not a respecter of persons. Greed, Jesus says there's many forms of greed. And then he's going to talk about it. I'm just going to look at two forms of greed today based on what he had to say. Be on your guard against every form of greed. Verse 15. So what is greed? I looked it up in the dictionary. Here's one definition. You can write it on the line if you like. See where it says greed? It's, here's what the dictionary said. A selfish, a selfish and excessive, a selfish and excessive desire for more of something than is needed. A selfish and excessive desire for more of something than is needed. Have you watched the, the TV show Hoarders? Wow. I don't watch it very often. I can't really stand it. It's a little creepy. But those hoarders have a form of greed. Collectors can. Now listen to me very carefully. I'm not saying if you collect something that's wrong. But if you, collections can become a form of greed. They can become excessive. It's, it's a selfish and excessive desire for more of something than is needed. Be on your guard against every form of greed. What was he really saying? Life is not about stuff. Right. You ever see the comedy routine George Carlin? I don't watch him much, but I saw one time he did a routine on stuff. And he talked about how when you're born, all your stuff is like in one drawer. And then maybe you've got a couple of brothers or sisters and you share a room and you may get one drawer in a part of the closet. Anybody share a closet? I did. I shared a bed with two brothers for, for many years when I was young. But then as you get bigger, maybe you get a room to yourself. And then you go off to college, and you can fit everything you own into the trunk of the car. And you share a room at college with somebody, right? Then you get your first job, you get your first apartment, and you fill that apartment up with stuff. Right? So you get a bigger apartment. You fill it up with stuff. So you get a house, and you fill it up with stuff. You fill the garage up with stuff, and you fill the attic up with stuff. So you get a bigger house, and you fill it all up with stuff. And then maybe as you get older, your spouse dies, and so you sell or give away some stuff, and you move to an apartment or a smaller house and get rid of some of that stuff. And then you get a little older, and you really can't take care of that house, so you get rid of more stuff, and you move back to an apartment, a smaller apartment. And then if you live long enough, you may get ill, and you end up in a, a rest home, sharing a room with somebody else, and all your stuff will fit in the drawer in part of the closet. <laughs> it's called the cycle of life. <laughs> the stuff cycle of life. And yet we, we act like that stuff is so important. Uh, I've got a beautiful home. It's a tract home, but it's got a big yard. And I spent yesterday taking care of my stuff, mowing the lawn. I've got a garden, and I was hoeing the weeds and uh, trying to kill the weeds. And I always talk to my daughters. In fact, they will say it after me. I'll look at it and say, you don't own anything. And you know what their response is? It owns you. Right. I said to them all, since they were little, I said, now remember, you don't own anything. And they go, I know, Dad, it owns you. The other saying is, if you don't want to clean it, don't own it. 
They don't like it when I say that. But stuff owns you. Life does not consist of stuff. It just doesn't. For even when one has an abundance, for not even when one has an abundance, does his life consist of his possessions. So my question to you is how much is enough? How much is enough? Jesus is going to tell a story about somebody who had a lot. Let's, let's look at the story. I'm just going to read it. I can't go into it a lot, but you've heard it before. Then he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. So he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Verse 18. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Now who's saying these words? In my Bible, there's red letters. That means Jesus was saying, well, I'm not saying this stuff, folks. It's Jesus. If you don't like it, take it up with him. <laughs> but Jesus is trying to help us. If God has blessed you in life, and you realize in America today, compared to worldly standards, most of us are extremely wealthy. If you travel around the world, you don't have to go very far to see how wealthy we are. We look at the folks that, you know, have a mansion on a hill and say, well, they're rich. No, they're not. We're rich. Most of the people in the world today are not sure where their meals are coming from in the days ahead. Or many of them are where they'll sleep tonight. So we're rich. But even when we're rich, Jesus said, Life does not consist of, those, of that stuff and that, those things. So how much is enough? I'm reminded of a famous rich, I think it was Rockefeller, that when someone asked him that question, how much more would be enough? And he said, just a little bit more. Always a little bit more. So don't chase money. And if you've, God has blessed you and you've been wealthy, that's great. Praise Him for it. Use those resources for His glory. But don't worship that money. So he was talking to the rich. Let's go on though and see what he says though. Another form of worry. So one form, one form of greed is you're rich and you worship that wealth. But look at point number two on the back side. In verse 22. Let's see what he has to say to those that aren't as wealthy. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. I can just imagine, if I was in the crowd and I had been following Jesus, how much did they own? What did the disciples own? What did Jesus own? As far as I know, the only thing he owned were the clothes on his back. The disciples had left everything to follow him, and so they're feeling pretty good. They're standing over here, and Jesus is talking to those rich people. And that's how we feel when Jesus talks about money. We look at him and say, well, we're not rich. Glad he's talking to them and not me. And it's interesting that in the middle of his discourse, he stops and he turns to his disciples. He's talking about forms of greed. And he says, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat. Now, why would the disciples be worried about what they would eat? Because they're just wandering around the countryside not sure from time to time where they'll be or what they'll eat. Remember the crowds Jesus fed with the miracles? And I'm sure from time to time the disciples would worry about what they would eat tomorrow. Or where they were going to get money for clothes. But he wanted them to know another form of greed is worry. Oh, it's easy to say the rich people are greedy. But you realize when we don't trust God in humble circumstances. That's another form of greed. Number two, do not worry about stuff. And he said to his disciples, for this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life. As to what you will eat, your body as to what you will put on. For this life is more than food and the body more than clothing. I've got four daughters and my wife. My mother-in-law lived with us for seven years with Alzheimer's. I had six ladies in my house. And people ask me, why do you travel? 
<laughs> no, my kids are great. My wife's great. But I want you to know something. I grew up with brothers. Remember I told you? And we didn't worry about what we wore. Half the time we had holes and stuff. Uh, my mom worried, but we didn't. But my daughters and my wife are different. They want to look nice. And I'm so glad of that. I'm, ladies, I'm glad you want to look nice. Your job is to beautify this world. And you're beautifying this auditorium this morning. And I'm, I'm glad. You should look nice. But when you begin to worry, and you begin to obsess, and you begin to, why am I going to wear this week? And why am I going to wear that week? And you walk up to a closet full of clothes and say, man, I haven't got a thing to wear. <laughs> That's a form of greed. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? Don't worry about what you eat or what you put on. Yes, look nice. Yes, try to eat well. But don't worry because Jesus said we need to trust God. My mom, as a youngster, grew up on a farm in the state of Washington. She remembers a day when she had two dresses to wear to school. And she'd wear one and then they would clean it and she'd wear the other one and back and forth. And at church one Sunday, an older lady complimented her on how nice she looked all the time. And my mom, a poor, poor girl, never forgot that compliment. Yes, we should be concerned about how we look, but when we begin to obsess about what we look like, and our makeup and our hair, then we're moving into the area that I think it's another form of greed. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? Then he tells another little story. Let's read it. Verse 24. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. I love to watch birds. Do you love to watch birds? They just flitter and flutter around. They seem to find food everywhere. God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing... Why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things. And your Father knows that you need them. But seek His kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. It's interesting to me that Jesus says the world, the pagans in the world, run after stuff and clothing. And they indulge themselves in food. And I worry about America in that regard. And I, I'm, I'm right there with everybody else. Baptists' favorite sin is gluttony, I think. I love our Baptist potlucks, and there's nothing wrong with enjoying food, nothing wrong. But do you realize there are some people that all they think about is what they're going to eat next? And the big meal they're going to have, which restaurant they're going to, and, and that's where your God, your belly is becoming your God. There's another form of greed. Oh, God, God wants us to love, enjoy this world. He just doesn't want us to worship this world. So he said, look at the flowers and the birds. God takes care of them. Don't worry. He'll take care of you. But seek his kingdom. These things will be added to you. So point number one was be on your guard against every form of greed. Watch out, you rich folks. Form number two was do not worry about stuff. And I'm talking to you poor folks too. And then point number three. The remedy for greed and worry. Look at verse 32. He's speaking to both the rich and the poor, and he says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Oh, I wish we could appreciate and understand what that means. God has given to us the kingdom of heaven, and we get caught up with stuff. He's given to us eternal life. He's given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He's given us everything we need for life and health and enjoyment. And we get caught up in stuff. He says, don't be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom of heaven. And then he gives us the remedy 
for grief and worry in verse 33. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. The remedy for greed and worry is giving. Now you notice he didn't say give to the church. And I'm not here to say Jesus said give to the church. Who did he say to give to? The poor. Folks, I don't care how poor you are. There's always somebody else. Poor. <laughs> and he's not just talking about money. Do you realize sometimes the best thing you can give somebody is some time? A listening ear? But here he is specifically saying, give it. I'm not much of a collector. I'm like my dad. My dad lived 88 years. He died a couple years ago. And he, my mom and dad's house is very simple. It's paid for. It's furnished. But nothing fancy. That was just the way they liked it. And when people would ask dad, well, do you collect anything? He would say, and I remember him saying it, the only thing I collect is friends. Isn't that a great saying? The only thing I collect his friends. And that was his lifestyle. And Jesus is telling us that if you have a problem with greed or worry, two different forms of greed, really, the best remedy is get your eyes off yourself. And in America today, every, everything in our culture tells us, take care of yourself, focus on yourself, indulge yourself. And God's Word says, no, true joy comes from giving, from helping others. Well, I don't have much money. Well, it doesn't take much. Everyone needs someone else to encourage or to help them. And I love, I don't know about you, I love to see it, find out about a need. I don't know what the need would be. And find a way to get a few dollars to that person without them ever knowing it. Jesus said, when you give to the poor, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And that's the kind of giving he's talking about here. He is not talking about uh, tithing and giving to the church. Although, I'm sure your church helps the poor, and I know through our convention we do. He's talking about each one of us finding a way to give. Because the remedy for greed and the remedy for worry <coughs> is giving of ourselves. Oh, and there's so many stories I can tell. I remember my mom, when she, my dad had his first church in Eureka, and he was a, working at a, ply, a, a sawmill full time so he could support our family and uh, you know with five kids uh, I know my younger brother wasn't born yet things were tight and there was a woman in the church that would come up to my mom every once in a while and just take her hand and put a five dollar bill in there and close her hand over and just pat her hand it wasn't much but it meant a lot to my mom are we looking for needs to fill or do we I think we become a culture where we think that's the government's job it's not. Scripture tells us it's our job. The remedy for greed and worry is giving. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes nor moth destroys. Hidden in that verse is a truth. As we give confidentially to help others, as we give out of love of ourselves and our resources, He's telling us we're storing up treasure in heaven. And there's a truth there. You can't take it with you, but you can send them some on ahead. Storing up treasure in heaven is when you care and you give for others. And then he ends with this verse, the last verse from my message, uh, from this passage. For where your treasure is, there your heart is be also. So replace re greed and worry by giving. And as you learn to give, as you learn to give and you learn the little ways of giving, that's when your greed and worry, worry will be replaced with contentment. That's where contentment comes from. Now I told you I had a sandwich sermon today, so I want to show you that, go back to, if you would, to, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I just want to read these verses to you. We're going to pick up in verse 13 of chapter 6. And now Paul. I want you to see how closely Paul's words match Jesus' words. 
I'm in 1 Timothy 6, chapter 17. And in my Bible, it's, it's the New International Version, the first word is command. That's a strong word. Some translations say teach. Some translations say instruct. My translation says command, verse 17, chapter 6, verse Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to fix their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I wrote those verses for you here in a different translation on your outline. But don't Paul's words echo Jesus' words? And Paul is telling a young pastor, Timothy, command, instruct strongly believers who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or put their hope in those riches, but to put their hope in God. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous ready to share. My word to you today is be on the alert for all forms of greed. And always remember that the real remedy for greed, whether it's greed of a wealthy person or a poor person, the real remedy is giving. And I'm not talking about giving to the church. The scripture says giving to the church should be an automatic thing. The Bible teaches a tithe. Giving to the church, Jesus said, yes, you should do that. But I'm talking about learning to live a lifestyle of giving to others. A lifestyle that will bring joy. Let me close with, with, with a story. I have the privilege of working with a lot of individuals who are, who are givers during their lifetime. And I put some of this newsletter out on the stand up front as you, as you leave this morning. In here you'll see a picture of the board of directors. You can use that for target practice. You may recognize the folks out there. There's one, there's one, what do you call somebody from Hemet? Uh, Hemeton? <laughs> a Hemetian or something. There's one Hemetian on here, and that's Doyle Braden. He serves on our board, and he lives here now in Hemet. But then there's pictures of other faithful stewards, like Polly McNabb. Some of you may know Polly, who worked for the state convention for so long, and, and Ralph Gardner, and others that have gone with the Lord in the last year, year and a half. And just a little story about them and about their good stewardship. Cliff and Joe Baskin were a couple who had one son. They worked hard all their life. They were savers. They were from the great generation. There's some members of the great generation here today. Your, your generation is a saving generation, and they were savers. As they got older, the foundation, their only son, whose name was Philip, like me, passed away. And I had the privilege of being at that funeral and helping with the funeral. And as they got older, they had no family to help them, and so the foundation became their family. We were the successor trustee for them, so we moved, they wanted to move to Arizona, so we helped move them to Arizona, and we helped get them caregivers, and then Cliff passed away, and Joe was by herself, but even though their estate was modest, we worked with them, and she stayed in her house for years, and we had caregivers come in. But their goal in life was when they were done living, and they were done giving to their family and friends. They wanted money to go to support missionaries. Their passion was missionaries. And from their estate, they left a gift. And it's not enough to change the world alone. But as you put those individual gifts together, it is enough to change the world. Because we're better together. together. I, I challenge you to read a copy of Pathways. And then I challenge you to pray. Where are you in your life? Our culture says, get more, get more, get more, get more. And keep it. Grow your I'm a Rich American account, that's your IRA, as big as you can, and then don't even spend it. Just keep it. But Jesus said, give. Does that mean give it all? Well, he told the rich young ruler because he knew the rich young ruler needed to. Give it all away. But no, he wants us to live with an open hand. Instead of worrying about how many Starbucks we're going to have this week, we should be worried about how could we help somebody this week with 20 bucks? 
Where is there a need? Is there a neighbor? Is there a friend that needs maybe a word, maybe a used microwave we've got? Instead of hoarding and piling, give. If you learn to give, you will be blessed. Pray with me. Father, Jesus' words are convicting. He owned nothing, and yet he changed the world because he gave everything. I pray you would teach us that truth. Help us to be a people that day by day, hour by hour, are looking for people we can give time to. We can give a dollar, a few dollars to, or we can give a possession we're not using to. Lord, show us, teach us to be people that are givers, not takers. I pray for this church. I thank you for this church and the fact they've been able to pay off their debt. But now I pray that as they may have a few more resources, that you'd make them wise stewards. Show them how to be a giving church. And Father, as we learn to give, I pray that your Holy Spirit would confirm in our lives the joy that comes from giving. Teach us to replace greed and worry, Father, with contentment as we give it away. In Jesus' name.